Then the Israelites travelled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor, near the river, in his native land. Balak said, A people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people, because they are, they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. For I know that those you bless are blessed and those you curse are cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite princes returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other princes, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of, my, of the Lord my God. Now stay here tonight as the others did and I will find out what, el find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night, God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her and to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, If you have made a fool of me, I, if, I had, if I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey? Which, have you, or which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Then the angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you, because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realise you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. 
When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the Moabite town on the Arnon border, at the edge of his territory. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? Am I really not able to reward you? Well, I have come to you now, Balaam replied, but can I say just anything? I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Then Balaam went with Balak to Kirath Hazoth. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and gave some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. The next morning, Balak took Balaam up Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw part of the people. This is God's word. The reading really should go to chapters 23 and 24 to complete the story, and I'm going to try and preach on chapters 22 to 24, but obviously just for the sake of time, um, we've chosen not to read out the rest of those chapters. Now, just in in brief summary, chapters 20... um, 23 and 24 speak about um, the way in which Balaam goes about trying to get an answer from the Lord. And uh, it talks about how God speaks to him and then takes him on a completely different path um, to the path that he originally is on. But I will try and do that through the readings. Let's pray. Our Father, as we read this passage, we are amazed at the way in which you are able to supernaturally intervene and do things that are just extraordinary. We thank you that you are God who is not, in some sense, limited by our own limitations. And sometimes the box we place you in, even though we may do it unintentionally, is never something that causes you to somehow feel constrained not to break out of it. So we thank you that you move in different ways to what we might consider to be conventional, that you are supernatural, that you do as you please, and your purposes are always fulfilled. And so we ask this evening that as we consider this interesting story in your word, that you would help us to come away from it, having grown in our understanding of who you are, how you work and how that relates to us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. In one of the scenes in the very first uh, movie about Toy Story, I don't know if any of you, some some of you are probably too too, uh, young to have seen the first one, although maybe subsequently you've seen it. But in the very first Toy Story, there's a scene where Woody has unfortunately, in, uh, as part of a, a mission, a rescue mission, has ended up in the hands of the boy next door. Now, the boy next door is a nasty boy. He likes to take toys and rip them to pieces. And that's what he does. He takes all these nice soft toys and he rips them apart. And he's got this evil little grin. And at the point in the movie where he's holding Woody in his hand like this with this evil smile and about to rip his arms off, suddenly Woody speaks. And this kid is shocked and he drops him out of sheer shock and then in sheer panic runs away screaming because this dead inanimate object has spoken. And we as the People watching find it quite funny that at last this boy is getting some justice meted out to him and doesn't or is prevented from accomplishing his purpose of ripping this toy apart. Can you imagine your dog turning around to you saying, by the way, that beating you gave me, it would, it would shock you. And, and the shock of this story is how Balaam doesn't even react. He gets into an argument with his donkey. Can you imagine that, getting into an argument with your animal? 
saying, see here now, well, well, what are you doing talking to me? I mean, wouldn't you just be shocked that the jolly thing's talking to you? But Balaam's not. He, 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 he misses, it's like it goes over his head. And there's some wonderful lessons that God wants to communicate through this passage that I think will be very helpful for us. Because sometimes you and I, unwittingly, can cause God to become boxed according to our ideas of how God should or shouldn't move. We, we claim that we believe that God is supernatural. We claim that we believe that God can intervene. And yet sometimes our prayers are, are so disbelieving, aren't they? We kind of pray and think, well, maybe God, you will do it. Maybe you won't, but we're not sure if you will or won't. And James writes to the uh, uh, churches that he writes to in chapter 1, and he says, if you pray with this disbelieving mind, you know, you, you're like a wave uh, tossed to and fro, and that kind of man is unstable and mustn't think he's going to get anything from God. And so there is a caution from James and an encouragement to pray expectantly and to think that God is able to accomplish the impossible. What I want you to see here firstly is the challenge to God. Verses 1 to 11. I'm going to read verses from the other chapters, so I'm not going to reread these verses. Verses 1 to 11. The challenge to God. Make no mistake that this is a challenge to God. Israel camped on the Jordan Valley opposite Jericho. And while they're encamped there, uh, Balak, the king, uh, sees them as a threat kind of the uh, Amalekites, and, and he is worried about how they may affect his kingdom. Now, what's really interesting, he refers to them as powerful. Now, that is because of the fulfillment of God's promise. What did he promise to Abraham in Genesis 12? That he would make the Israelites more numerous than the stars. Now, this is already, the fulfillment of that prophecy is already beginning to occur, and this king is frightened that these people are going to threaten his kingdom. Their reputation precedes them, because he has heard about how the Amorites have suffered defeat at the hands of the Israelites. However, he recognizes that his allies, he seeks help from the Midianites, that they are not strong enough to take on the Israelites. And so he seeks supernatural help. And so he goes to this well-known figure, Balaam, and he seeks for his intervention. Balaam is a mantic. Now, mantic is simply a diviner, someone who practices magic arts, someone who dabbles in the dark side. And, and what he would do is he would cut up animals and take their livers and cut them out and, and, and perform certain rituals in the hope that it would give him some kind of supernatural insight into the world of the gods. And he is not a prophet gone bad, but he's a pagan diviner. And what Balaam thinks is that he can control the gods. You see, for him, Yahweh is just another god. Just like you get Moloch, just like you get Asherah, just like you get Baal. This is just another God. And so if he can get answers from these other gods through his divination, then what's the difference? He can do it with Yahweh. But what he's going to discover is that Yahweh is unlike any other God because he is the only true God. He is a, a, a man that... Uh, is not trying to be good. He's not a prophet of God. He's not a prophet gone bad. Let me quote from one of the authors. He is altogether outside Israel's prophetic tradition. He is a pagan, a foreign national, whose mantic accent on animal divination, including the dissection of animal livers, the movement of animals, the flight of birds. He believed he had a way with the gods, had a hold on them, could control them. To him, Yahweh was not the Lord of the heaven, but just another deity whom he may manipulate. He was in for the surprise of his life. He wants to manipulate God, but God is sovereign, and God will not be manipulated. So this approach 
to God is a direct challenge to God to somehow cause God to do what he wants him to do. Now, before we condemn him, do we sometimes do that? Do we sometimes think that we can manipulate God by good behavior? You know, if I live in obedience to God and I do everything that God has commanded me to do and, and I have my quiet time and I'm praying and I'm living in obedience and submission to God and I'm serving God in the church, wasn't God obligated to bless me? Isn't God obligated to answer my prayers according to the way that I want them to answer? Or sometimes we may even utter prayers like this. Lord, I promise to get involved in that ministry if you give me that job. Lord, if, if, if you enable me to find a husband or a wife, then I promise you, Lord, for the rest of my life, I'll serve you. Lord, I haven't studied for that exam, but you know, Lord, I promise if you enable me to pass the exam, I will get involved in serving in church. It's so easy to manipulate God unwittingly, isn't it? Sometimes we are no better than Balaam, but Scripture makes clear that we cannot manipulate God. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, God will not exchange his glory for another. Isaiah 48, 11, the same refrain is repeated, God will not, I will not yield my glory to another, says God. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, God is sovereign and he does as he pleases. He is not accountable to anyone. He is not answerable to you and I. You and I cannot, in any sense, manipulate him. You know, they say, psychologists tell us in the grief cycle, there's a, a stage, there's four stages to the grief cycle. And one of the stages is bargaining, where people begin bargaining with God. God, if you heal me, I will X, Y, and Z. But God is not manipulated, unlike us who so easily are manipulated. I remember growing up and, and every now and then my mother would say to me, Ian, can you go and make me a cup of coffee, please? And with much grumbling, I would go and make a cup of coffee. And then I would give her the coffee and she would say to me, after taking a couple of sips, you know, Ian, you make the best coffee out of anyone. It was outright manipulation. But I was too young to realize that at the time. And every time I put the coffee in, I'd do a little jiggle and think, right, I've got the amount, amount of grains in it, I'd put it in the right amount of milk, and, and, and I must be getting everything just perfect for her to enjoy. And it was instant coffee on top of it. I mean, how can instant coffee be nice? David knows. Speak to David afterwards. God is not like that. You and I do not manipulate him for your own ends. You may want certain things in life, good health, security. You may hope that God will bless you with lots of money, with a great marriage, with good children, but he may not. And we need to remember that you and I don't coerce God. We don't twist his arm. We don't make him do what he has not purposed to do. We don't have that kind of power over him. He is not answerable to us. Secondly, I want you to notice the control of God. Look at verses 22, uh, verses 12 to 20 again for the sake of time. I'm not going to read them. And verses 35b, the control of God. God controls the entire situation that confronts Balak the king and sending of the messengers to try and get Balaam to come back in order to get him to curse the Israelites right from start to finish. Uh, 
he sends out the first delegation. He is forbidden to return. God says to them, no, don't go. And so they go back. And then Balak gets a little bit angry and he says, no, 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 no. He sends more people, offer him more money because you see, th this is a way to pay. This is a way to manipulate God by paying the prophet. Pay him. This time there's a minor variation. God permits him to go, but then says to Balaam, you only say what I command you to say. Now, isn't that interesting? Here is a pagan. Here is an unbeliever who is being contracted to curse God's people. Now, God could simply just ignore him and just leave it to be. But rather, God chooses in his sovereignty because he's controlling the situation that he's going to take a situation that from a human perspective can seemingly see bad because curses are going to come and turn it around completely so that it benefits his people. Now, doesn't that encourage you? Because you see, in your situation, in my situation, from a human perspective, there may well be people out to harm you, to curse you, to make life difficult for you to make it uncomfortable for you. And yet God is able to take those same people and so direct them that the outcome ultimately is for your good. That's the kind of God we serve. Two questions are raised in this, though, as we read through these accounts. The first question relates to Balaam's status. Look at verse 18, and I'm going to read that. Verse 18. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small or go, or go beyond the command of Yahweh, my God. Do you see that? He has the audacity to claim Yahweh as his God. And now we mustn't misread that text. This is not Balaam somehow being a prophet who's just gone a little bit bad or belonging to God in any sense. For later in Scripture, he is soundly condemned. In fact, he will lose his life in battle against the Israelites later on in the story. Not in these chapters, but later on in the unfolding revelation of God. He just uses those words as a way of trying to claim control over God. Trying to create the impression that he is belong he does belong to God. And therefore the confidence that they are expressing in him to be able to get an answer from God is well grounded, but it's not. So don't misunderstand those words. Joshua chapter 13, verse 22, special mention is made as how Balaam is slain in Joshua 13, 20, slain in battle. His name is mentioned. Or in 2 Peter uh, 2, verses 15 and 16, he is presented in an extremely poor light. And then again in Revelation, in one of the churches that has gone wrong. Second question relates to God permitting him to go. But what I want you to see here is God's permission for him to go is a result of God's changing the situation from one of cursing to one of blessing. So rather than Balaam manipulating God, God is going to manipulate Balaam. And Balaam is going to discover the hard way that Yahweh is sovereign. And that Yahweh accomplishes all that he seeks to accomplish. And we are simply his servants. In spite of God's permission, Balaam still has hidden motives. We're going to come back to that. As seen by the incident of the donkey. So when he goes, even though God has said, I want you to bless my people, he's still thinking in terms of making some money out of this by cursing God's people. But God turns even that around. Though Balaam is a pagan prophet with a hidden motive, God reminds us that even people who are bent 
on destroying God's people can be used to accomplish good towards God's people. And that should give you great encouragement. It's very easy to allow ourselves to think that somehow we are subject to those who would make life difficult for us. But even they are in the hands of Almighty God. He's in control and works in mysterious ways. You remember the hymn? I did have a chair. I have got a chair. We used to sing this, but a long time ago, I don't know if I've ever sung a chair, but someone might be able to correct me. God moves in mysterious ways. He's wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep and unf unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Judge not, uh, sorry, his purpose will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter. And he will make it plain. Believer, God is in charge of your life. You are not subject to people. You are not subject to slurs. You are not subject to those who would destroy you. You are not subject to those who will harm you. They are subject to Yahweh. They fall under his authority. He knows and he sees and he is able to execute his plans. And accomplish all that he designs to accomplish in your life. In spite of opposition that you may or may not encounter. Thirdly, I want you to notice the confrontation of God. Verses 21, uh, 22, uh, chapter 22, verses 21 to 35. This is such a, a humorous story. And it's, you, you're meant to laugh when you read it. Um, what is unseen by the reader is seen by the Lord. Balaam's intent is not to honor God. There are hidden motives bound up in his heart. No one else sees those hidden motives, but the God who is omniscient, the God who knows everything about everything, where no thought of ours is hidden from his sight, sees. Al Shaddai, the God who sees. God's omniscient is one of those uh, attributes about God that helps us to remember that there is nothing that happens in this world, nothing. There is no thought that any single human being ever has that is not an open book before God. Not one. He looks down into the depths of our being and sees with absolute clarity every motive that you and I have. You and I hide nothing from God. You can hide it from me. You can hide it from your husband or wife. You can hide it from your parents. You can hide it from your girlfriend or boyfriend. Or you can hide it from your children. You can hide it from your boss at work. You cannot hide it from God. He sees. Balaam has created the impression that he's a spiritual man. He manipulates the gods, but he can't even see into the spiritual realm. Because when an angel of Yahweh, and normally when Lord in capital is used, it's probably a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ, who's standing there, sword drawn, ready to slay him. The donkey, the animal, the dumb one sees. And the so-called spiritual man who claims he knows and claims he sees, sees nothing. 
In other words, his spiritual deadness is exposed by a donkey. A donkey. Furthermore, and even more ironic, when the donkey speaks, Balaam still shows a complete lack of insight. At the point at which the donkey opens his mouth, you think Balaam would stand back and say, my goodness me, what on earth is going on here? I don't know about you, but I've never heard a donkey speak. And animals were often regarded as omens in Mesopotamia. Thus, a talking donkey should have immediately caused him to realize, particularly because of his background and his spiritist activity, should have immediately alerted him that something unusual is going on. But it doesn't. What have I made you to beat me three times? You think Balaam at that point would say, What's going on, donkey? What does he say? He gets into an argument. You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The irony is that the one he wants to kill is the one who has saved his life. And he doesn't see it. He's as blind as a bat. He's in spiritual darkness. Is that not the condition of every person outside of Christ? Spiritual darkness. Why do you think it's so jolly difficult to explain to an unbeliever the gospel? They cannot and do not see because they are spiritually bound in darkness. They are under the control of Satan, shackled to him. And it is only through the revelatory light given to them by the Holy Spirit as he unveils the word of God into the depths of their soul when the spiritual scales are lifted that they are able to see and come to faith in Christ. Being an ungodly man, he beats his donkey three times. He would have killed it. In fact, the donkey is more rational than Balaam in this encounter. Balaam's reply then, as the angel of Yahweh addresses him, indicates to us his real course of action. He was on a reckless course of action. And so the angel of the Lord, st Lord stands there to prevent him from accomplishing that, that reckless course of action, which was a result of the hidden motives. He was out to make some money. And even though Yahweh had said, don't curse my people, probably he was still bent on doing that so he would receive the money. In spite of what he said, I can only say what the Lord said. That was just lip service. And thus he confesses. The angel of the Lord asked him, verse 32, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come to oppose you because of your path is reckless, one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would have certainly killed you by now, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of Yahweh, I have sinned. Isn't that interesting? Here is an immediate confession. So the angel is right, because the angel of the Lord, if it is the pre-incarnate Christ, sees into the depths of the heart of Balaam, and he exposes it. And Balaam recognizes this is not just some spiritual realm encounter that he's had with some dead, inanimate object that supposedly has godlike status. No, this is an encounter with the living God. Immediately is humbled. And he says, if you are displeased, I will go back. That's not the point. You see, it's not the going back that the angel of the Lord wants. 
but it's the going with these men and only saying what God wants them to say. That's the point. Don't say anything other than what God will direct him to say. Sometimes God confronts us when we have taken wrong paths, doesn't he? Not because he wants to destroy us. Not because he wants to make life difficult for us but because he wants to steer us back onto the right paths. Sometimes the voice of the Holy Spirit by way of conviction into the depths of our soul comes to us. And Jesus says, if you are sheep, you know my voice. You hear it. You know the difference between my voice and other voices. And that voice comes to us through the Holy Spirit who sometimes says to us, my dear child, get back onto the right course. You're going off on a tangent out here, and there's only danger there. There's only spiritual destruction there. It's not going to help your faith. It's not going to enable you to grow. It's only going to cause harm and pain and heartache. Come back to the path that I'm directing you on. Does not that come out in Hebrews chapter 12? Where the author to the Hebrews writes to these people and he says to them, you've got to understand God only ever disciplines in love. What parent would not discipline their children? A parent who doesn't love their children. But God who has infinite love for you, expressed in his son Jesus, wants to say to you, my child, I have insight into the future. I can see where this is going to end up. And if you keep going down here, great harm is going to befall you. So listen to my voice. Turn away. This is the way Isaiah says, walk you in it. These are the trusted paths. These are the paths that have been laid out that are known to you. Don't depart. Sometimes God may need to stop us in our tracks for our own good, for our own benefit, because He loves us too much to let ourselves destruct. And then, fourthly, I want you to notice the confirmation of God. Verses 22, uh, chapter 22, verse 36 to 24, 25. So this is the whole rest of chapters 23 and 24. Um, and I'll try and do it very quickly. God confor- affirms that Israel are a blessed people. And nothing will alter the covenant that he has made with them. Balaam cannot curse God's people. Because God has determined a covenantal relationship with them or entered into covenantal relationship with them. And as a result of that covenantal relationship, God will not break covenant. His people break covenant all the time. They rebel against God over and over and over again. And every time they rebel, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet. And even when he sends his own son to his people, they put him to death. But God never abandons them. He never breaks covenant. Does he? He fulfills his covenant towards them. And thus in the their three oracles that come, God reaffirms promises made to Abraham. We won't read them. In the first oracle, chapter 23, verses 7 to 12, Balaam reaffirms that God will make Israel into a great nation. He goes through this whole process of sacrifices, which he repeats. Seven was a, 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 a number that was used in the pagan world, considered to be a, a sacred number. So he sacrifices seven things, and, and he makes a sacrifice. And God comes to this pagan, and God speaks to him. Because at the end of the day, even the unbeliever belongs to God whether they like it or not, or whether they acknowledge or not. You can't get away from him, can you? 
And so he says he will make Israel into a great nation. He will keep his promise. And Balak's efforts to invade and to try and destroy Israel will come to nothing. God will fulfill his promise. They will be a great nation. Second oracle, chapter 23, verses 13 to 26. Now, the, the scene kind of moves, and, and, and Balak takes Balaam and shifts him to another position, gives him another viewpoint, as if shifting location is going to somehow cause God to change. And this time around, God reaffirms he is faithful to his promise. In other words, he says to Balaam to tell Balak that God doesn't revoke his promises. God doesn't go back on what he has said he will do. God doesn't change his mind. We dealt with this about two weeks ago in the morning service. God is immutable. And so he never changes. Never. Because to intimate change means that there's something defective. God is perfect. So God just simply reaffirms his promise. They're going to become a great nation. He's not going to change his mind. He will protect them. He will ensure their safety. He will make sure they enter into the land. He will make sure they defeat all the people in the land. For God is faithful. Now, that is true of you as a believer here this evening. God is faithful to his promise. He will never abandon you. He will never cast you aside. He will never discard you. And Paul writes to Timothy and says, even when we are faithless, he is faithful. Isn't that amazing? Even when our faith wavers, even when we stray, even when our faith is weak, even when we're living in unhealthy, disobedient ways, God says, I've got you. I'll never let you go. Never, ever let you go. God keeps his promises. Third article, verses 27 to chapter 24, verse 13 reminds Balak of how God will bless them with a fruitful land. In Genesis chapter 12, promises given to Abraham were for uh, land, were for a, a nation that would be blessed as numerous as stars, and that God would enable them to enjoy the fruit of the land. And he reminds them that those who curse Israel, God will curse that's part of the original promises given to Abraham. Abraham is told, people who bless you, I will bless. People who curse you, I will curse. God will remain faithful to his covenant and does so throughout his ministry, uh, their, their, their history. And the other reference I was quoting was 2 Timothy 2.13, for those of you who are writing down, down about God's faithfulness. But here is a God who does not suddenly decide because of the disobedience of his people or because they are frail or because they are doing things they shouldn't do that he's going to just give them over. The fourth oracle is even better because that talks about the defeat of Moab and the surrounding countries. It will happen in the distant future 300 years later. 2 Samuel chapter 8 is the fulfillment of that. But what's the problem with the defeat of the surrounding nations? I'll tell you what the problem is. Is that every time Israel departed from God, God instituted his curses on Israel. And every time he cursed them, he brought other nations around them who rose up again to execute God's judgment upon them. So Israel, even though they defeated those nations in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8, they were, those nations would come back to haunt them sometime in the future. Even though there was a general defeat, and even though Saul defeats the Amalekites. And so there is even a greater promise that comes out of this, because that's not the primary promise. It looks to the more distant future, when finally all opposition to God and his people will be laid to rest. 
And all of that comes and culminates in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whom we are told in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 25, that when he returns, all the enemies of God are placed under the feet of Christ. Sin is defeated, death is defeated, disease is defeated, suffering is defeated. All those who rebel against God are defeated. And finally, God in Christ will reign in victory forever. And all opposition to God will be quelled. So even now, where sometimes opposition may prevail, where it may not always be that you are able to be vindicated in situations where you are being persecuted or where you are being treated unjustly or unfairly or where your enemies seemingly prevail or where we are in a society where we are in the minority and it seems as though when it comes to certain things that Scripture condemns that the general public who is a, a, in a greater majority of us seem to always prevail. A day is coming when Jesus shall return and put it all to bed. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus will set up his eternal kingdom. And there in that kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, all of God's people will reign with Christ forever. That's our hope. That's what we look forward to. Therefore, whatever your state, whether you're rejoicing or not, whether you're under pressure or not, whether you're suffering at the hands of others or not, Remember that not only will God not desert you, not only will God be faithful in his promises and he promises grace, but God will ultimately see you home. And you will go to be with him forever. And one day, one glorious day, all the wrongs in this world will be put right as God stands on his throne and he judges the nations. And the only people who can look forward to that day with great anticipation are those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. For Christ will be their vindication. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word this evening. I pray that it would be a wonderful encouragement to your people. May we rejoice because you are sovereign and you are on our side. And you are the God who remains faithful and the God who accomplishes all you set out to accomplish in spite of sometimes the opposition we face. May we trust you. May we rest in you. May we sit at the feet of Christ. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we sing now. This song was chosen with a different sermon in mind. But nevertheless, let's stand.